Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Tina and I am the Capability Building Coordinator for Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. Connecting Up is a part of the Info Exchange Group. Info Exchange is a not-for-profit social enterprise that has delivered technology for social justice for over 25 years. With over 100 staff across Australia and New Zealand, we tackle the biggest social challenges through the smart and creative use of technology. I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar, Moving Your Organisation to the Cloud, an Introduction to Office Office 365, which will be presented by Conan Daly from the IT team. We'll start with a little bit of housekeeping. All lines are muted, so if you have any technical issues, please type it into the questions box on your webinar panel and I'll be able to assist you through there. If you have any questions during the session, please also type it into the questions box and Conan will answer them in the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. Please note that your comments and questions will not appear to the entire group. If you are on a Wi-Fi connection and have multiple programs open, this can sometimes affect the quality of the audio and video of the webinar. If possible, please close all other programs to help you have the best experience. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and the slides will be sent to you shortly after the webinar ends. Before we start, I'd also like to remind you that there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar. We'd appreciate it if you took a few minutes to provide us with some feedback. That's all from me for now. I'll hand it over to Conan to get things started. Thanks, Conan. Thanks a lot for that, Tina. Yes, uh, as Tina said, my name's Conan Daly. Uh, I'm the general manager of the IT team. Uh, so um, there's a little bit of, I've got a little bit about us coming up shortly. Uh, big thanks to everyone joining this webinar. It's a, it's a really cool topic um, and it's pretty exciting, the potential of Office 365 for, for NGOs or not-for-profits. And so, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. There's quite a lot of content uh, and I can talk very fast, so bear in uh, apologies for that in advance. And this is my first webinar, so there might be a, a few uh, teething errors, but uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. So first thing we wanted to do was kick off with a bit of a poll, and this is just going to allow me to um, get a gauge on what the audience is, um, uh, well, who the audience is. So please, is it, the poll should be up now. Please go through and uh, chuck your answers in there. We'll share the, we'll share the um, results if we can. Are we able to do that, Tina? I, I haven't seen them yet myself. Cool. Yes, I've just shared the results. Can you see that? Uh, I can't actually, but that All could right. be just me. Um, I'll let you know. 39% um, oh, have here said we go. none see at all. <laughs> yep. Cool. 15% are using licensing Office software through Office 365. 17% uh, have email within Office 365, 2% have documents and email fully within Office 365, and 27% use Office 365 for documents, email, and other functions. Brilliant. Okay, that's that's great. So, yeah, we expected we, we expected that. We're going to have um, quite a bit of content for people that are uh, completely, you know, not using Office 365 at all, so there will be a fair amount of content for those. But then also, I think those kind of are the different steps or levels of engagement, I suspect. And we do have quite a few people that are using a few elements of Office 365, which is cool. There will be parts of this presentation that might uh, be a bit obvious to those people because they've already gone through that journey. But um, you know, I do think there's going to be something for everyone. So, but that gives me an idea about what areas I can focus on. So just uh, continuing through. So. What you're gonna get out of today. Um, so the key thing is we're gonna talk a little bit about cloud. Uh, cloud's a term that uh, you know gets thrown around a lot and it's and I think it's important just to highlight you know what what the cloud is and I guess the benefits. What is Office 365 in a nutshell? We'll go through that. The benefits of Office 365, ways that not-for-profits are, are actually engaging with Office 365 because we do have a bit of experience and and see some of the ways that they're getting into it and also um, you know, taking advantage of functions that are specific to this industry. Then also the, um, the key functions of Office 365. We'll do a bit of an overview, not gonna do a demonstration just because it's a bit slow and it takes a bit of time, but we'll show you a few examples of, of it and talk through how it looks and how it works for those people that haven't, uh, haven't used it. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to get started and uh, how you could consider the migration 
there is going to be a Q&A section and I hope that um, as many of you ask you know heaps of questions technical or non-technical um, I've got a bit of a background in the technical side of the deployments um, although my staff would probably run that down a little bit but um, uh, so we can uh, if you feel free to throw technical and and the commercial stuff at me cool continuing on so just a little bit about the IT team um, so we uh, formed in 2011. Um, now, the key thing is that we were born out of a natural disaster, which is actually quite applicable to this. So uh, earthquake in Christchurch in 2011, some of you may know about that, some of you might have heard something. Um, it meant that we lost our building and lost all our IT, basically. Um, so we started to use Office 365 from then and also started to use it with a lot of our customers. And so for us, it was a bit of a, a, bit of a big turning point for understanding how valuable cloud services could be to situations that are, you know, you don't expect like natural disasters or to be fair, you could say the up upcoming um, potential pandemic that we may all be facing. So there's a little bit of uh, similarities there, just maybe not as sudden. Um, so yeah, we've been using Office 365 for, for basically since the inception um, of the IT team and uh, do a lot of migrations. We do uh, not just Office 365, generally everything related to IC support, IT support, VoIP, um, internet, everything, servers, the lot. Um, we have a very large not-for-profit base, which is, I guess, why we're doing this presentation. Um, they make up uh, a lot of our a lot of our customers, and uh, we are fairly experienced in the in the industry. It's our, it's our largest, um, I guess, uh, vertical. Uh, we work with customers in New Zealand and Australia. We've got offices in multiple locations, and most of our work is done remotely. So, jumping into the cloud, what is cloud or what is the cloud? It is a broad term and sometimes it's it's used a little bit, um, I guess, cynically, you know, uh, because there's no real definition and you don't need a stamp of approval to say that you're in the cloud. What we would consider a cloud service to be, and this is complicated and I'll try and keep it as simple as possible, but in some form of data center. So not a server room in your IT provider's office or in the corner that doesn't necessarily mean it's in the cloud, um, but really it should be in some form of, uh, of, of data center. Um, geographically redundant, so you'd ideally hope that if your services are in the cloud, they are in multiple locations, be it that they're replicating from Sydney to Melbourne or Sydney to Asia or Auckland to Sydney, so it's always Sydney apparently, uh, but generally some sort of geographic distribution so that if one city as a major incident, your services are not going to go down. Harbour independent, obviously that goes with the geographical, geographical redundancy. You would expect your services, if they're in the cloud, not to be tied to a single piece of hardware. Um, most of them are subscription based, which means you're paying, you're not owning anything, you're paying a monthly fee or a regular fee based on a per user or per consumption uh, basis. Um, the cloud generally covers terms like, you may have heard terms like software as a service, PaaS, SaaS, IAS, these are all terms in the cloud. The key thing is that uh, software as a service is generally, how would I best describe that? It's the, the subscription that you're usually paying um, for uh, per user. I mean, Netflix is technically SaaS, but Office 365 critically is a SaaS service. Whereas if you had your servers in a data center like Azure, or maybe there's a, an operator in, um, in Australia of note that uh, has their service that you would be subscribing to having your servers in their data center, that would be what we would call infrastructure as a service. And there is a big difference in, in how they are priced and how you, how you access them. Um, in, in general, I think SaaS services have great advantages for not-for-profits and most organizations because you don't have to worry about what is happening behind the scenes or the consumption. You just pay for what you use. And critically, as the last point is, the infrastructure is managed by the provider. You don't have to get your IT provider involved to maintain that service. So yeah, any, I'm sure I've missed plenty out. Some of you in here will be saying, what about X, what about Y? Feel free to chuck it at me in the questions. We'll continue on. So what is Office 365? This is a very good question. Um, and Microsoft don't do themselves any favors by the way that they, I guess, explain and market and bundle things in there. Office 365 um, can be the software that you purchase to run things like uh, Word and Excel, because technically that is Office 365. But broadly speaking about Office 365, it is a broad suite of services that Microsoft enable for you to subscribe to. Um, in, in, in a series of packages. 
Um, these are several of them. So you've got things like email, you've got things like Teams, you've got OneDrive, you've got SharePoint. Then you've obviously got things like Word and Excel and PowerPoint, which are the traditional applications. So a few things about this. So it is a broad suite of applications as I've shown you in the previous slide and we'll come back to that a little bit later. It changes frequently and what I mean by that is they're adding tools all the time, which is really cool and generally they're pretty impressive tools that they're adding to help organisations do, do more. There are different types of licences and I need to highlight that not-for-profits and, and, and the team will talk to you at the end about some of the options and how to get access to them, but there are some very good uh, discounts or free licences that are available to not-for-profits, which is which is a real uh, benefit to you guys. Um, critically, you can use some of the services, but not all of them. We expect, and we talk about it a bit. Uh, I'll talk about it a bit shortly. You will. You, you're never going to use them all. You're only going to use some, but you might um, grow your usage of several of them as you, you know, take a bit of a journey. Um, and you can only, you, you can just use one one of the services and leave the rest dormant, even though you have access to them, if you like. Um, Word and Excel and Outlook and OneNote are part of it. Um, and I need to highlight this because it can be a, a misconception. Running in the cloud and running in Office 365 does not mean you are using web, you're using these things web-based. It's cloud-based, as in it's stored in the cloud. But myself, for example, I like to use the desktop apps. I like to use Word on my desktop. I like to use Outlook on my desktop. I don't like to use web versions. I'm a bit old school. So, and that is, the, you know, something that you can do in your organisations. You can try and operate, off, use Office 365 in a more traditional way if you like and just get the benefits of, of having these things in the cloud. So yeah, it's cloud-based but not solely web-based, although you can access almost everything in on a, on a web page if you like. There's plenty of this. Hopefully it will, it will become clear as we go through. So Key benefits for NGOs, not-for-profits, charities. Um, so probably one of the big ones that we think is sometimes a reason for moving is the security aspect. Um, the security, the potential security in Office 365 is, is really strong. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll basically the baseline security settings are, are, are at least usually a big improvement to what you are likely to be using now. Um, there will be some exceptions, of course. And then the, the the potential additions, such as things like multi-factor authentication, which I'll come back to soon, allow you to take your security from you know here to here without investing significant money or possibly any money um, to be able to do so. And the other thing is it is, um, and I'll come back to a bit sh shortly on, it, it's generally from a security point of view, Office 365 gets the big tick from the various government authorities, which is a big benefit. Um, if you say to various ministries or government departments, we are using Office 365 to store our data or Azure, they are usually going to, by default, say, okay, that's that means they're at a certain level, so that's a that's a positive. Um, price, it could be free for you guys, or it could be a, a, a very low price um, to to access the subscriptions. From a commercial point of view. For example, um, the Enterprise One licenses, I think they are somewhere around $12 um, per user. For not-for-profits, those are free, up to a certain quantity, but it's quite a high quantity. Um, so, you know, there's some big benefits there from a price point of view. The features, the, the features that you will gain from moving from, say, your a basic mail system or a basic file server to 365 are enough of a reason to do it. It just allows you to do more. Backups, this is often a thing that's important. Um, sometimes our data is not backed up very well, and uh, particularly if it's on a file server or on our local workstation, moving to 365 is just gonna get your mail, your documents, and a lot of things backed up and synchronized, and, and there's gonna be version control on a continuous basis, which takes that worry away. Minimal support. Um, basically, since Office 365 is managed by Microsoft, you don't need to worry about the support, it's done. Your IT doesn't mean you can completely get rid of your IT provider, um, but it means that you're not having to worry about them effectively maintaining the system. And then future updates, it's continually being updated. So you can, um, so th there'll be new, new functions um, coming out that you can take advantage of as we go. Four years ago, Teams wasn't, I think it was four years ago, Teams wasn't on Office 365, and now it's one of the, the biggest elements of Office 365. So yeah, just an example. Now, a couple of things I'd like to highlight that are, that are somewhat important and I think valuable to not-for-profits, uh, NGOs. Um, the ability to work anywhere. Now, if you have 
the more you put into Office 365, the better. But um, if you have most of your services in 365, effectively your staff can work anywhere at home, in different offices, different countries, and have the same experience, which is a big benefit. Um, you can pretty much do everything on a mobile device, although it's not going to be as good as using your laptop, but you can do it if you're in a, if you're in a bind. Um, you can work offline like on a plane, so it's just to highlight that this is not just a web-based solution. You can do a tra traditional functions like working offline. Um, and a couple of things to highlight are millennials, um, technically I'm millennial, although don't look like it. Uh, millennials will account for over 50% of workers um, effectively in the next couple of years, or it might be now. Um, and these, this group generally will seek roles, positions that allow flexible working. So it, it's kind of becoming a, it's not a bonus, but it's it's going to become competitive if you are restricting everyone to, if, if, if you're solely restricting everyone to an office. That's debatable, but this is what we are hearing. And then I think the mobility of your IT is really important with things like the coronavirus and how you can work from home because as we know if this kicks off and it's looking like it is going to be a thing um, then uh, the ability to have your staff work well not just able to work but be able to work well from home is a pretty important thing now security this is a big thing now i, I want to highlight this because 10 years ago when we were working with not-for-profits um, and we had a few of them, not, not as many as we do now as customers, uh, security wasn't a big thing. Um, but as a lot of you will have, um, will know you have data that is highly sensitive and uh, needs to be private. Um, often medical data, perhaps sort of social services type data. Um, and this is this is stuff that is coming under more scrutiny from the various government departments and needs to be secure. Um, whereas some not-for-profits or NGOs are operating with pretty poor security. And they're gonna, it's gonna be a bit of a pressure cooker. In, in New Zealand, for example, we're seeing uh, the privacy acts are changing and, um, and the, the ministries are putting a lot of, uh, a bit more scrutiny on what the, the not-for-profits are doing with their data security because they know that if sensitive stuff gets missing, it's effectively the government's fault because they've given the contracts to, to a lot of these not-for-profits. Um, so it is becoming a thing. So we think it's a very important uh, factor when you should consider your IT and a good reason to consider a move like this. So. 76% of organizations have been victim of a phishing attack, and that's from 2018. The thing is that a lot of the time, they just don't know it. So a phishing attack, and you might've come across this, is often when you get a, a fake email that sometimes looks, you know, asks you to click here to access an invoice or whatever else, you know, cl click on this link and sign in, and then they get your credentials. And usually what they do is they actually just spam out to your, um, to your uh, your contacts, um, and it's a bit embarrassing, and you say, I'm sorry, I've been hacked, and you may have received this message, and it wasn't actually from me, it was from a hacker. This is a very common thing. What people don't often understand is that what the hackers are doing often is they're actually extracting information from your email or other places like Dropbox without knowing and also spamming out, and so they're actually getting this data. And if you think that you're, a, you're a, an organization that has uh, clients uh, that are um, that you're having sensitive interactions that are maybe government contract or something like that and I know I'm talking about that a bit but I think many of you will have sensitive data about individuals if that data is sent somewhere else often and, and effectively harvested you might not know about it but it's happening and eventually things are going to start getting tracked back to you and it and, 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 and it's happening. It may have already happened to you without you knowing, there might not have been any repercussion, but it's going to become a bigger thing in the future. So I just wanted to highlight that, that these can be seem innocent and minor, but they're actually pretty serious if you've got sensitive data. Continuing on, so um, Office 365 is managed by Microsoft, and we kind of say hanging out with the big boys, they're taking at least a, a reasonable degree of our responsibility for the security of your data. They won't stop people from grabbing your password and getting into it, but they're gonna stop it from being a back-end thing where someone attacks Microsoft to get your data, which is pretty helpful. It means that you know, you've know you got to expect a certain level of credibility uh, when you're, um, I guess, saying that my data is held at Microsoft's data centers. 
not saying that there's no chance of your data being compromised because the phishing attempts show that, but it's just compromise without you doing anything is, is likely to be uh, far reduced. Office 365 has inbuilt spam and malware filtering. There are advanced versions that you subscribe to, but the baseline has, has those functions. You may be paying for that with another service. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the recommended security standards set by default, things like password policies and that kind of thing are pretty good. You know, So you're all, already getting, um, you, just by entering it, you've got a certain level of security that's, that's at least uh, um, above average, I'd say. The two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication is available and we would recommend it. Um, if anyone would like to know more about that, uh, please ask in the, in, in the questions. It's a, it's a really good way to, uh, he, with other services as well, not just 365, to uh, kind of accelerate your security. Data sovereignty, um, pretty much all the data will be based in Australia if you provision a, uh, a subscription now or recently. Um, it could be in Asia if it's, if it's um, an older subscription, but uh, generally it's in that area and it is possible to set it. And then um, the Azure AD functions, this is probably for advanced people, uh, allow you to heavily improve your security on your workstations and other things, and I can get into that in detail if people want to know. Just something that Office 365 does for you, uh, so if you're on Office 365 and some people will have access to this and not know it, go and have a look at your security score. The cool thing about this is you don't have to ask your IT the question of how secure am I, which is a common question. You can go and look, you can see your score comparative to the average and um, and some things you can do to improve it. So this is an example is if you moved, you can kind of get an idea of your security and if you are already in Office 365, I encourage you to seek this out. It's pretty cool. Just continuing on. So how are, how are we seeing not-for-profits using uh, 365 or accessing Office 365? So most commonly not-for-profits will, will start small and go from there, they'll either move part of the organization or the organization to a small part of Office 365 as opposed to going whole hog with a big migration. Starting with email is a good place to start and I'm going to mention that a few times. So uh, we'll, we'll often jump in uh, to, to using, um, sorry, clients of ours when we're working with them will often start with email and grow from there. Um, but they are often migrating to Office 365 just to get the improved security and that's a, definitely a factor. And then the video conferencing is a big benefit. So usually we see people move some of the organization or organization to uh, exchange, get a grip on security, and then start to tap into the video conferencing parts because it's pretty easy to get that started. Um, E1 licenses are free for not-for-profits. This includes Exchange Online, which is email, OneDrive slash SharePoint, which is document storage, like your file server, and then Teams. All those are free, um, which is a great uh, you know, starting point and it covers a lot of it. And then the Office software is separate and you can get that via 365 or you can likely purchase it via TechSoup. Um, and it's uh, a, and, and the, the, I'm sure this will be touched on la later, there's, a, there's ways to do it cheaper than others, but really you can purchase it via um, Office 365 at a reduced rate as a not-for-profit or via TechSoup as a reduced rate. But we're generally seeing start with E1 licenses, get into Exchange Online, and that's a really good place to start. So just going to go through some scenarios now. Um, we're going to put up a poll in a minute, but the key thing in these scenarios is what we're trying to show is these scenarios might ring true for a few of the scenarios might be uh, ring true to your situation. None of them may. Um, there might be part of them that is, uh, or um, it could, but, but there's a good chance that one of them will be familiar to you. And the key thing, it's not set on each slide, but Office 365 generally keeps all the pros of those scenarios, um, the existing scenarios, and eliminates the cons. What we're going to do before we jump into the first one, we're just going to pop up uh, our poll number two, if we're able to, um, Tina. You still with me? Oh, we're there. So it'd be cool just to answer this. You might not know. It's some of these have can you know not the most straightforward terms, but uh, do your best. If you've got very very basic email from an ISP or a web company, it's probably basic pop. But you could say not sure. And we'll share the results as we did last time. I, I can't see it now, Tina. By the way, just I've found it. Excuse me for that. Fantastic, thanks. All right, 
right, so we've got, oh, we've got a big mix. So we've got, um, look at that, 39% are using Exchange Online, which is brilliant. We're using Office 365's email service, Exchange Online. We've got a good chunk that are using G Suite or Gmail, and then uh, uh, the majority are using either Pop, IMAP, or Not Sure. There's 20% Not Sure, so that's um, that's really cool. So that gives me an idea of the audience, and it's probably about what I expected. So um, we'll just continue on through these scenarios. I'm gonna bolt through them. Uh, so a scenario one would be you're using POP or IMAP. So this is a traditional mail system. It's, it's been around since the, you know, people, this is the same system that people were using in the 90s effectively. Um, it's for a small or large organization, you know, most commonly a small one, but there can be large organizations that are using this. Um, it's often bundled with web hosting or an ISP and therefore is low cost. The pros of POP, are, it kind of just works and that's a cool thing, and you've been using it for 15 years and it's just worked and you don't have any complaints, so you just keep doing it. And also it's uh, it's, it's pretty low cost. The cons, and there are these are just some of them, the cons are numerous. There's no backup, there's no synchronization. IMAP has some synchronization, but it is limited. Um, there's no generally no or poor spam filtering uh, as part of the package. The security is really low. Usually there's a password that was set 10 years ago and it's the same password um, because of the way that it interacts with Outlook. You generally don't change the password often except when something goes wrong. And then the the, the pop mail service is just emails. It's not calendars or contacts or anything else generally. So it's pretty limited. So that could be your scenario. Another scenario is you're a bit more advanced. You're using Exchange um, in your in your office. Um, you might be using a you might be a larger organisation in this case. I'd imagine that you would be if you have an Exchange server, um, not using Exchange in 365, even though it's the same product. It's usually provided by your IT provider, probably a server at your office or in a hosted location. The good thing about this is it's a great product. It's the same as an Office 365, though, of course. It works well. It's fast, and you can customise it if you need to. The downsides are um, you have to have a server. So, you know, it's going to be a reasonable cost. You've got to buy hardware. And then the high cost, and it is high cost when you when you put it over a year, of backup, spam filtering, you know, malware filtering, and support. And we know we do it. It costs a lot. It takes a lot of time to support an exchange server. Um, there is a high cost of that. And then the security can be mixed. If it was set up by us, by me, in the mid 2000s the security was probably pretty average um, so file server uh, this is similar to the last one this could be a scenario that you have you've got your documents in a file server this is probably on site could be a workstation storing files you but really you're storing your documents on a physical server um, it's this is likely a mid-sized organization to a larger one but could be a smaller one if they've uh, if they've you know gone on to it a while ago um, probably managed by your IT provider um, the pros are fast, customizable with powerful permissions. It's it's good. Uh, the cons are again like the last one: requires hardware, requires a server, high cost of backup, maintenance, etc. Um, and generally, these if you've got a file server, it's not as easy to get your files outside the office. You probably have a VPN or something, and it's just not as ideal as others. There will be variations to this. Some people have sophisticated ways of getting around these, but really you're going to have a server, so your costs are going to be up there. Um, and then another option would be something like Dropbox or Box or something like that, or Google G Suite, Google Drive. Um, you're probably paying for this on a monthly fee on a credit card, Dropbox and some of these, and Google Google Drive or whatever it's called now, um, can be, uh, they can be really good. You know, we don't really think the products are problematic. They're actually pretty solid. Um, and uh, easy to use with third parties. If you're sharing links, this is a common way people use Dropbox. Um, the downside is they're not free, generally, um, and the inconsistent setup, because generally these are self-set up, and so security is a bit of a problem. And I think the main thing is it's just another service to, to manage. So you probably, if you're using Dropbox, you've got this, you've got that, and you're probably adding up the number of services that you're managing and the number of passwords and accounts, et cetera. And then another scenario which we commonly come across, which is a little bit more broad, would be around video and audio con conferencing. Um, so you could be uh, using uh, Skype or Zoom or a cell phone on a table. It's not uncommon for a cell phone on a table to be the preferred option for when you need to dial in a customer or a, or a client or a staff member that's on the road. The, and your situation, if, it, if it's one of these, will resemble, usually you use it as rarely as you can because it doesn't, it's not a great experience, so you just 
use it if you have to. Um, if you're using Zoom, the quality will be really good, um, but it, but it, is, it does cost money. Uh, if you've got a distributed workforce, the meetings in the office are really good, but when you've got someone on a, on a screen or on a phone, they probably aren't enjoying the meeting as well as you are. Um, and then when you're contacting someone in a different that you've never communicated with and you have to dial in a few people, usually you'll use the lowest tech, tech low, lowest tech, uh, you know, thing you can use as possible, which is often the cell phone and the quality is poor. Um, we might put up, before we move on to the next one, we're gonna do a couple of polls. Can we go to poll number three, please, Tina? Should have done this earlier. Excuse me, got a bit excited. But we'll get the data and we'll have a chat about it. This is a bit of an interesting one because it's very it's very understandable for people to not be sure, completely understand. Um, usually you have to know a little bit or um, have been told what you have, um, or you see something like Dropbox often. And sometimes you could be using a mixture of these, which makes it a bit difficult. So look at that. Okay, so I'm not sure it's very low. Well, I'm wrong. I was wrong. Sorry about that. Um, local workstation, that's a good example. Uh, file server, this is a high portion. Well, look, I think uh, I might touch on that a bit more uh, shortly, but Dropbox is, um, when we come to the OneDrive segment, I'll touch on the file server. Dropbox is a smaller portion, and then uh, a few people using Office 365 documents, which is great. So, um, Tina, are we able to do, just while we're here, because I skipped, missed the boat, uh, the next poll as well? Yes. I think this is our last poll. Brilliant. Okay, so Zoom's pretty popular. Wow, that's cool. Um, I'm going to come back to that because that is important. But look, there's quite a few people do nothing. A few people use Skype. I'm not sure if people can see. Tina, are, are the audience able to see this or do I need to talk through it? Uh, yes, I'm sharing it with the okay, audience. Okay, cool. Sorry. Okay, so you can see this. Zoom's obviously very popular. I'm going to touch on that more when we get to the team section of this, um, just because I think it is an interesting, uh, it is an interesting point. Thank you very much for that uh, that data, people. Um, it's very interesting to see. Okay, so just talking about the elements of 365, um, there are a lot of them, and you know, so email is covering email, OneDrive and SharePoint are covering uh, documents, which some of you may know and some of you may use. So OneDrive is generally for the individual user elements, and SharePoint is generally for your organization-wide documents. And then you have a large amount of other things. You've obviously got your office suites. Um, you have Teams, which is pretty powerful. Flow, which is a very cool tool. We're not gonna go into a huge amount of detail on that today, just because it's getting a bit advanced. Same with Planner, Delve, Sway, and forms and power apps. These are kind of your advanced functions. But um, yeah, I think there is there is a lot that you can do, but the core cool ones that we're kind of going over today are email, OneDrive and SharePoint, Teams, and uh, and, and then the Office Suite. But feel free to ask questions. Um, now what was on the next slide? Okay, yeah, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but this is just to highlight a common migration path for not-for-profits. So what we see is start with moving your email and get it on Exchange Online. It's kind of the center of it and it's a good starting point. Then move, and, and this is something you could take to your IT provider or your managers on how to actually transition and the functionally, so everyone knows what email is and documents, we've tried to use that terminology. But this is a really good pathway. So move your email to Exchange Online, it's kind of the starting point. Get your documents gradually over to SharePoint and OneDrive for Business. Look at starting to use Microsoft Teams for video conferencing and conferencing. Then a bit more complicated, transfer your identities from a domain controller, if you have a file server, to uh, Azure AD, which could be already in there, um, and start to use that, particularly if you've got Windows 10, uh, as your authentication method. Now, there might be some questions around this and I, we can get into great technical depth about this. Feel free to ask some questions at the end or if there's any IT people in this and they wanna know more about that, I'm happy to talk to them directly because it can get quite complicated. But the key thing is 
you can move away from having a, a server in your office that you authenticate with uh, to using Office 365. Um, that is very possible. Teams for internal communication, which I'll show soon. And then you start to be able to decommission servers, um, backups, uh, um, your uh, your Dropbox or Google Google Drive or whatever you have and you're paying for, and you can really cut down on what, you're, what you have in the office. It's very possible for most organizations, depending on what other application they have, to get rid of their servers. And then after that, they start looking at the other things. But it is can be quite a good place to start is to focus on email documents and the, and the communications parts of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just about to run through, and this might be a bit simple in some ways, so bear with me. I'm just gonna show some of the, some of the tools within Office 365, uh, just so you see them, because some people won't have seen this, some people this will look very familiar to them, but I just wanted to showcase that and talk a little bit about it. So email, if you're using, you might be using G Suite. We've got we got some poll data earlier on, um, but a lot of people are using Pop and IMAP. And if they're using Pop, they're probably using Outlook. Exchange Online operates very similar to that. The key thing, this is a screenshot from my inbox yesterday. Um, so there's, yeah, I haven't really looked at what's in there, but anyway, that's not important. Um, so you'll be using Outlook. If you move to Office 365, you continue to use Outlook but it does enable more functions, such as it will synchronize with your mobile phone perfectly. And when I say perfectly, I mean perfectly. If I delete this, that's not mine, by the way, that was one I got on the internet. But if I delete this email here, it's gonna delete it on my phone within a couple of seconds. Um, it also allows things like calendar sharing, which you can use across individuals and things like um, cars and that kind of thing. Um, but the calendar system is very powerful. If you don't use it, you should. And uh, But the key thing is, if you move to Office 365, and this can be a confusing thing, you can still use your Outlook application like you do on your desktop. And that's what I use. I'm a bit of a traditionalist, um, and I recommend people do. You can use it via the web and the mobile phone, but you're still probably going to use it on the desktop. So that's Exchange. It pretty much has every function that there is in here, and it can hold a huge amount of email, so you don't have to worry about running out of space. Moving on, communication and teams. Um, so I could talk for a long time on this, and we've just done a webinar specifically on teams uh, for TechSoup, and there's probably gonna be another one later in the year, and if you're interested in this, I encourage you to get on board with it. Tina might be able to make it available at some point if you're interested, because there's a recording of it. But fundamentally, Teams is a very powerful tool. What we use it for, and a lot of our customers and organizations, is communications on an individual basis. So I'm messaging my team um, and asking them questions and contacting them. You know, it's one of those things where sometimes you don't want to call someone on the phone, you want to ask them a question, but you don't want to interrupt them and you don't want to send them an email that's going to get lost amongst the email. And so we're often communicating. We have cut down our email heavily in favor of using Teams, which is faster, you could say less intrusive and um, and a bit cleaner and more informal for us to be fair, which is a good thing. You can use it on your phone, use it on the uh, on the desktop app. It works really well together. But we use that for one to one and one to many communications. Then importantly, this is kind of a, a modern replacement for an internet. You could say uh, Teams. This is where we put a lot of our communications in. These, these examples are not brilliant. Um, you know, this is just a shot I grabbed today. So we've got, you know, for example, this one is one of our, our staff are saying we have a, a, an education topic today, which is actually going on right now, um, which is around uh, someone from the, the bank is coming in and talking about managing debt. So we post that up there as opposed to sending an email around. And then we also, uh, Shay is asking about um, Warren of Fitness. It's not all informal. A lot of things in here, we have practical working examples um, practical working purposes. We put projects in here. That's a really powerful way to use Teams. Um, but as you can see, there's health and safety, there's um, new customers, service desk stuff, there's a lot in here. Uh, we're not, this setup is a bit dated. It, it's, we're not using it as well as we ought to and we're working on tidying it up. But look, as I said, I could go into massive amounts of detail on this. It's a very powerful tool for communication. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, sing out. And then the video calling uh, is obviously part of Teams. So it does your one-to-one -one instant messaging to help reduce your email. It does your um, kind of company-wide communications or project-based communications, which also is, is an efficient thing. And then it does your calling, 
and it can do uh, handset calling as well as a replacement if you'd like more information on that we can certainly help that these are not our staff this is obviously Microsoft's um, nice looking uh, people uh, they're, they're obviously uh, probably a series of models uh, that have been um, taken a screenshot of and so uh, but it does look pretty good when you're using teams um, we generally highly recommend headsets we've got the USB ones um, and we use this extensively we have a team across multiple locations and um, we used to use zoom and zoom is really really good it's powerful and initially we weren't really keen on teams um, we had issues in 2017 with the quality of the calls now we use teams every day we have um, probably like others we had a situation where we would conference people in for a big meeting like a staff meeting and we would leave them out <laughs> we'd just exclude people in different outside of our head office um, for uh, our um, kind of for project meetings if we had something on security or we were doing a project we'd almost just say oh it's too hard we'll just exclude them but now we do a lot of meetings at our desk as opposed to moving into the meeting room and we communicate with each other a lot the quality is really good it's very fast and it does work um, the coronavirus is a thing that is on our minds and I'm sure it's on a lot of your minds and we are starting to try and envisage what is possible possibly going to happen to us and we there's been a bit of um, you know, a bit of information coming going around and we kind of started to ask ourselves if we had to work from home for six weeks how well would we be able to work and since we've started using teams as extensively as we have which has really been the last six months we've realized that we are far more equipped than we would have been um, our meetings are not they don't have to be in a meeting room we are very far more comfortable having them at the desk and people at home and people in different offices and I think you you could consider this how well you would be able to work um, remotely and would you just start stop you know cancelling meetings and reducing meetings or having mobile phone meetings which aren't as good just a little tip for us when we're doing a teams meeting we require people to use the webcam because it's not really a meeting if you can't see people um, and, it, and it ups the engagement and focus and you can see the whites of their eyes and see their body language which is really important so I just encourage you to think about that and what what are ways that you can improve your ability to work in the event of a disaster and Teams is kind of a it's not really about that but it is a bit of a booster I would happily answer more questions but I would suggest you check out our webinar which hopefully Tina will be comfortable passing on um, this is something that I haven't mentioned yet collaboration examples um, so if you're running your documents and uh, this is over you know, better than Dropbox for example if you're running your documents in SharePoint OneDrive you can uh, co-edit with peers and we do this a lot when we first did it we thought it was a gimmick but it was a cool gimmick but then we've moved to starting to use it quite extensively so this is an example this is probably a bit dated but literally we, we will sometimes be doing an RFP and there'll be multiple people working and instead of the old days where we used to someone would work on it in the morning and then say I've done my bit let me know how you go or make changes or even like um, the the uh, the review thing where you add add points or notes um, we used to do that and it's just not very effective now everyone jumps into the doc you live edit you can see the activity you don't have to save it and email it around or anything this is actually once you start doing it you start to realize how important it can be to improving the ability to work on documents fast and it is cool so this is how it works people all have it open on their desktop not on the web and they are live editing and you can see where they are so um, OneDrive and SharePoint got a couple of points on this and I don't want to go into too much detail but the key thing I'd like to say is that it is very possible for you to move your documents from Dropbox your documents from a file server or your your workstation to OneDrive slash SharePoint I have to highlight that the naming convention for this doesn't do Microsoft any favors SharePoint has been around for a long time and it's a web based it's considered a web based intranet system it is that but it is more I'm gonna I'm just highlighting how I this is my personal don't look too much into the docs and my filing system which is terrible but how I run my uh, documents so I'm a traditionalist I like to use the Windows Explorer which is your general you know file explorer system this here is my OneDrive which is my document so this is my dumping ground for files I'm working on and I'm writing um, I'm writing them in there I'm not really in a position where I'm going to file them in the company directories 
I'm kind of just working on them. And uh, for me, and I'm mucking around, I'll put them in here and they're backed up and synchronized and I can get them multiple locations. This here, and it doesn't show many of them because we've got a lot of directories. This is the organizational kind of file shares. And that's stored in SharePoint, but it's accessible via Microsoft Explorer, just like a, if you've got a file server, you've got M drive, N drive, O drive, whatever you call it. We use it just like that. So we have a series of drives that are synchronized down to, to all the computers. There's a thing called smart sync, which means that it doesn't have to pull all the data down and I could go into detail on that, but I won't. But really what I'm showing you is you can access this stuff via the web or you can use it in a traditional way like Dropbox or a file server. And it does work and it's not just for your personal and home and, and your own data, it is can be for your company drives. Um, yeah, so any questions, ask me about that. Accessible on the web, accessible via mobile and all that as well. So, and then we also use SharePoint as an intranet. As you can see, this is the IT team. So I just grabbed one. We've got a health, safety and wellness team and a hub. And we put, put it's annoying that that cuts that out, but if we've got a, um, a health and safety issue, we've got that there and we'll click on it and it's got a form and that's how we use it. So we file things, but we use it more for process than like a file server replacement. So yeah, it's just an example. You can do that, but the thing is, don't do it immediately. You know, I'd suggest, get certain things in, start to get your documents over and then start to explore this and go, okay, how can we use this? That's what my recommendation is. Other cool things that I should highlight. So Planner is a really cool project management tool. It integrates with Teams. We use it for giving each other tasks and assigning tasks to ourselves. Um, it's really good as a kind of to-do list and also a company-wide to-do list and a project management tool. Uh, Power BI, you may know about this. Um, we're gonna have a webinar in the coming weeks. Um, uh, Tina might talk about it at the end, uh, which is around Power BI and, um, well, we're going to go into a bit more detail about Power BI and how you can build dashboards and, and, and get, aggregate data across your organization to, to showing visual data. It's a pretty cool system. And then Forms and Flow or Power Automate are really powerful ways to automate processes. I showed you a couple, but not really. We use it for our timesheets. We use it for our uh, leave requests, credit card requests, and it basically to allow you to remove paper and accelerate the process. There's a lot in there and I can't go into all of them today, but but they do exist. I'm just keeping an eye on time. So just to kind of move towards wrapping, um, how can you adopt this? As I said earlier, best to start somewhere, just get started. And you may already have an Office 365 account, probably 40% of the people do have this on here. Um, E1 is a really good license to get started and I, I expect the uh, TechSoup guy is gonna come on soon uh, and talk about that. Um, and this is a good way to, to get started and it's free. Um, we suggest starting with email. Setup is actually easy. It's the migration that is the complicated point. So you could talk with your IT provider about how to migrate your email or your files over. Uh, TechSoup could help, you could talk to us, there's lots of ways to do it, um, but you might want to start with your IT provider. Hopefully they are keen on this, if they're not, then have a word. Um, set goals for yourself, a, a common way to go, okay, we want to move to Office 365 or we've moved email, by the end of the year or by next year we want our doc, that's probably a long bit way out, but in a few months or in a year we want all our documents, we want all our communication systems to be in 365, all our identities to be there, and we want to eliminate our server. These are realistic goals that you can do. And I think understand the other problems and reasons for moving to 365. Security is a big one for you guys. Mobility is a big one with the coronavirus and various other things that are happening. So it's a really good idea to go, okay, these are the reasons we're doing it. It's not just because it's a cool tool. Um, we want to improve our security. We want to get rid of our server. And this is the path that we want to take and then work with your people. So where to from here? So we're going to do a cute. We're gonna do a Q&A in a second, uh, but the uh, TechSoup guy is gonna speak briefly about licensing and how to access it. Um, if you want a migration assessment, that's something we do, you can contact us. Um, there's an ebook on Teams, please feel free to check this out. Uh, there's a link there, um, that's for Teams, but there is also a webinar that we might be able to distribute. You can sign up to our newsletter, but the key thing is if you have any questions and you just want advice, you don't want to, book a migration or anything, you just want to ask a couple of questions, please let us know. We're very keen to help and just, you know, it, it can be daunting to know how to start, uh, but just feel free to reach out. So, uh, how are we doing for time? Good, okay. Before we go to question time, I believe that uh, Tina, someone is gonna jump on and say a few things. Is that right? 
No? Thanks, Conan. Um, we have Eric from our team who will um, jump online now and say a few things about the CSP program that Connecting Up have. Um, so, Eric, feel free to take over. Thanks, Tina, and thanks, Conan, for the webinar. It's been great so far. Look, I won't take up too much of your time here, guys. What I might do is let me just see if I can make myself the presenter very briefly. I'm going to share a very, very small PowerPoint, I promise. It's literally two slides. So let's hop to it. Hop to presenter mode. Here we go. Hopefully you guys can all see that as I stuff it up magically. All right, fantastic. So connecting up, as Tina and Conan have mentioned, are providing CSP or cloud services now. Um, as Conan has talked about a couple of times, there are different licensing parts for Office 365, and really we can help you work out what licensing you need. We're more than happy to provide advice and solutions as to what the different plans are out there, what might work best for your organization, whether it's a combination of those great free E1 licenses that Conan mentioned earlier with things like Exchange Online and SharePoint, or if you need things like the Microsoft 365 Business Donation is a not-for-profit, you can get 10 of those and get some of your Office and Windows 10 licenses sorted as well for free. So there's a lot of really good stuff out there and then of course there are discounted plans as well so unfortunately this is only available in Australia at the moment so if you are in New Zealand have a chat with the IT team they are great at this as well um, do, do shoot them a question but obviously here in Australia we have got this available so please have a chat with us um, I have got as well a website here so here's our cloud services page so this will give you a little bit of an overview of what we've got we have links to all of the different plans that are available there's more information that you can click on which will just bring you back up to our website here which as it loads on our internet da, 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 goes through the different subscription options options as well as all the different pricing and plans that you can have a look at. So we've got all the information here. If you want more information, you can fill out this wonderful form here. Um, that'll come through to me. I'll be able to schedule a catch up with you so we can have a talk through what your requirements are. Or if you've just got any questions around validation or what might suit you, or if you have more advanced questions like migration as well, we're more than happy to have a chat with that. We're working with our colleagues over at Info Exchange in Melbourne who provide a lot of the more advanced consulting and migration services. So we may pass you on to them as well to have a bit of a talk. But the short answer is obviously the Office 365 licenses have been around for a long time. And for the longest time, we've really only been helping out with validation services. Now we're able to offer pretty much the whole suite. So if you have got, if you're looking to get into Office 365 and you haven't started yet, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, fill out that form. I'm more than happy to chat with you and help you out with what you need. Otherwise, like I said, if you are in New Zealand and you're looking for this, have a chat with the IT team, as I've already mentioned. They're fantastic at this. They're really good. They'll be able to give you all the advice you need. Um, likewise, here in Australia, we're more than happy to offer that. Like I said, I know we're running short on time here. I know you guys no doubt have lots of questions, so I will put you back through to Connor now. Thanks for your time and have a good afternoon, everyone. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, Conan, I'll set you as a presenter again. Cool. And um, as Eric mentioned, um, Australian organisations can contact us and New Zealand um, can contact Conan and his team. I will send out all the details in an email with the recording after this session. Um, so happy to jump straight into Q&A, Conan, if you're ready. Yeah, yeah. I think um, just, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this at the beginning, but if you have a question and we don't get to it, we will get we will get to it offline, uh, no doubt. So don't be afraid to put something in, even if it's a bit unusual. Uh, we like those, uh, or com complicated, we like those too. So you just uh, just chuck them through. But Fantastic, we do have lots of questions that have come through, so let's get straight into it. Um, the first one is, um, I know nothing about Office 365. Does it give any more megs for emails? I understand it will send a thousand emails an hour. Look, I think the short answer is, if you move your mail service to Office 365, you are not going to have any concerns about the limits of email or the amount of email you're sending. Unless you're some sort of weird hacker spam bot system, it's not gonna be fine. It's not gonna have an issue. So with um, other services that you might be subscribed to, there may be limits of, of storage. What, what you get is you get up to 50 gig of email storage, which is a ton. And then you can use archives to access more. So if you have 50 gig, congratulations for start, but um, you you know most people won't have 50 gig. So I would say the short answer is, uh, you are not gonna have any issues with limitations with email and Office 365. It will enable you to do everything and store everything. And if I'm wrong, 
and you think I'm wrong, let me know and we'll help you, you know, navigate through that. Sorry, Tina, Thanks, go Conan. Um, next question is, what does PAS, P P -A -A -S, stand for? Platform as a service. Um, don't want to go into too much detail on this because this is getting into the sort of geeky territory, but it's, um, you got software as a service is generally a, a service that is packaged up often via a web page or via, a, um, you're just accessing the subscription. Um, infrastructure as a service is when you're, you're putting your server into, and you're accessing the infrastructure. So infrastructure as a service means like hardware as a service. And PaaS is when you're accessing the platform. And the most common example of platform as a service is um, storing your database in the cloud. So they're providing the platform of SQL, but you're providing the database. So it's kind of mixed level of complexity. If you want to know more, let me know. I don't want to bore everyone on this <laughs> webinar, but yeah, it's platform as a service. Great. Um, does Office 365 give publisher as well? Uh, yes, it does. I mean, publisher is a bit of a dated application, but it does. I think it's available on business premium and E3 plans. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure about publisher online. What I'd say is that it's a you can get office, you can get publisher via Office 365, and um, I'll I might. Uh, Get, get some information just to confirm how, if that's okay. So I'll, I'll confirm that via um, off, offline. Great. Um, next question is from Amanda. Um, and I think the question was incomplete, but she said, speaking of security, is a data stored onshore? Um, and it has something to do with uh, part of their government contracts. Uh, if you are in Australia um, and you are subscribing new, to a new, the challenge is before a certain point, if you provisioned your Office 365 subscription, uh, it might be basing it in Hong Kong or Singapore. But if you more, in more recent times have engaged in a new subscription and you're based in Australia, it will store everything in Australia. There is, but they will say that it may replicate in failure to other locations. So. Um, the answer will be, will likely be yes, it will be installed in Australia. If you're in New Zealand, it is stored in Australia, but if you have concerns around government requirements, there are some key information that uh, is out there that has been white papers and, and, and documents you can uh, work on, which basically confirm that the government, within reason, will allow you to store it if it follows certain guidelines in Australia in Office 365. So the answer, sorry, and the short answer to that is, uh, it is, it is almost certainly will be located in Australia. Okay, so, um, next question is with 365 Exchange, do we need to look at having a backup of this? If a staff member deletes an email, I understand it will only be kept for 14 days. If we need to be retaining access to emails, what would you recommend? Do we just put all users into litigation hold? Good question, terrific question. Um, and I could talk about this for too long. I would say that we, we we encourage companies to add a layer of Office 365 back up if they you know can afford it, to be fair. Um, it's kind of a secondary layer of protection and often it's to protect against yourselves, not Microsoft. Um, however, uh, there are ways to access email, recover emails beyond the 14 days, but your IT provider will need to do it. There's some cunning ways to do it. I think um, if you have particular data concerns, I would recommend getting the, a third party backup solution. Um, but if you are less concerned about losing email, uh, I'm just thinking about the best way to answer this because I, I'm, I'm trying to say it's not essential, but if you are, have a heightened level of concern about this, for a three dollars a user or whatever it is, it's sometimes a good idea to do so. We have not been in a position, the IT team, where we have failed to recover an email despite how long it was deleted once we figured out how to do it. So we haven't failed to recover anything yet, but that doesn't mean that we won't. So I think it's about your level of risk. If you cannot accept any and you really need to back it up, pay for the service. If you're a bit more sort of, look, we're comfortable with the level of backup Office 365 requires, and there is a chance that we might lose some data, well, you might want to stick, uh, you might be able to just stick with the regular service. 
Thanks, Long Conan. Answer, um, so. Matt has asked, Zoom is a good is good as clients don't need an account, just the app on their device. How does this work with Office 365? Uh, Teams is the same. So, um, uh, and it's, it, sometimes people aren't aware of that, but um, uh, when you, I could almost do a demonstration, but basically when you have Teams, you send out a calendar request, um, kind of similar to how Zoom does it, and uh, anyone, without a Microsoft account, without anything using whatever, clicks that link and it will open the app, kind of like Zoom does, or open in a web browser, kind of like Zoom does. So no account is needed. It's the same, effectively. It's just not a lot of people don't know that. Okay, uh, and the guys from the IT team did do a great webinar around Teams and um, they covered this in their webinar as well. I'm happy to share that link with anybody who wants to view their recording as well. Okay, next question is, um, when using email on phone, does all the send and deleted email still show in the computer? Yes, so if I understand that question correctly, if you, how Office 365 works is, um, it's synchronizing between all devices. Really, there's a master copy at Office 365 in the service, and then you receive a copy on your workstation and your mobile phone. If you delete an item in your, from sent, if you, well, if you send an item on your phone or your computer, they will show up in your sent items on both devices. If you delete something on your computer or your phone, it will delete on both devices. Obviously, everything is recoverable, but yes, it is the same across both systems. Okay. Same with if filing we... something. If you file something, if you file something into a folder, it will be the same in both in both locations. Sorry, Tina. No, that's all right. <laughs> if we have a small team of four to five, is Teams worth it? What is the best thing to use for webinars or video conferencing? Great question. Um, look, it's a, I think so. Um, you know, it's if you if you're always working in the same location, you know, like a shop or something, or you know, a small office where people don't tend to work from home, it might have less benefits. But I think more and more we're going to be distributed. It's a great repository for storing information about your organisation and. You know, it can be a centralised place. Um, I'd say the answer is yes, and I'd, and also you can use it for webinars, and you can use it for um, conferencing, of course. I'd say check out our team's um, our team's uh, presentation if you're on the fence. Uh, but my answer would be yes. Great. Um, how do you do backups with Office 365 to protect against malicious or accidental data deletion? Good question. So. Um, Effectively, the baseline, so you, let's talk about documents and emails. So emails in Office 365 and documents in Office 365, there is a something called version control for documents and uh, and emails are all protected. If, if, if you have a malicious, let's say, let's say a, a rogue staff member or a hacker goes in and deletes everything, well, you can recover that. That is recoverable. Someone mentioned earlier there is a, there is a, a timeline where it, Effectively, it deletes from your deleted items. And so if you come in one day and your emails are gone, um, you'll be going, okay, what's going on? And then you can su submit a ticket to Microsoft or you can go to your deleted items and recover them. Now, people can delete from the deleted items. These are still recoverable, um, but there is a good level of protection for malicious attacks. Things like a crypto virus or um, you know, ransomware type thing are, are also a factor. So if you have your OneDrive or SharePoint documents on your computer and, and a ransomware rips through and locks everything, um, it used to be recoverable, but a lot of work, but now it is quite easy to roll back. So what happens with Office 365's document control is you get, there is a version held of every change on, in existence, including deletions and modifications. So you can go back and see every change. And so effectively the deletion or the edit, the encryption of that document is just a version. So you can go into that doc and roll back to the previous version. So as I mentioned before with the, the other question, there's good baseline protection in backups. It, you know, it, that's instead of backups and it's really the version control and, and how it handles deleted items. But if you're highly concerned about it, we always recommend that you can add an additional layer of third party protection. So, hope that answers your question.
Thanks, Conan. Um, next question. Why use Azure AD for authentication if you're removing all servers and just logging in via Windows 10? Does that approach still require an AD server on site? Great question. Um, so I'll try and answer this not just to you but to the to the, to the wider group. Um, what a domain controller at your office, a domain server, what its primary purpose is is to authenticate your computer and other services against a server. So some of you will have this and some of you won't. And the thing that you often see is when you start up your computer, it will ask you, it will have your organization name and then you'll enter your username and password and you will log in. When people don't have a server, they're just logging into their computer. The downside of that is it's very easy to breach a computer without a centralized authentication system. So a small organization won't have a domain controller generally, and so really their workstations are just like home computers where, to be fair, there's not much security on them. Using Azure AD, and I need to highlight this for that person, the, the particular service that you might want to research is called Azure AD Workplace Join. And what it does is it allows you to, with Windows 10 devices, to connect your laptop, desktop, whatever, your Windows 10 workstation to your Azure AD to act like a domain controller. It has less functionality, like you can't do group policy, you can, can kind of do it with something called Intune, but it has less functionality. But mainly, if something happens to that laptop, it's lost or whatever, or the user leaves the organization, you can restrict that workstation from accessing, well, from logging in, that account can be locked. Um, so effectively, it's instead of you authenticating with your domain controller in your office, you're authenticating with Azure AD using Azure AD Workplace Join. Slightly less feature rich, customizable, but it does do the job. That person, if you're keen to talk or anyone else on that, we're happy to give you the nuts and bolts of how it works and the downsides and how to potentially get around some functionality that you may use. But in that case, we say, if you can do it, if you've got all Windows 10 workstations and you transition your authentication, you can get rid of your server. And then yes, there is no need to have a server. I really think it, if you're moving your documents, you're moving your email and you're move, moving your identities, the only reason you need a server is if it's doing something with an application, maybe a CRM, and that would mean it's not online. And in that case, you've got to maybe see if you can get a different CRM. But yeah, that's something else. Thanks, Conan. Um, we do have a whole heap of other questions to get through. So I think we'll just go through a couple more and then we'll take the rest of them offline and have you um, answer them um, as we have in cool. the past and email them out to everybody. Um, but if you still have other pressing questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and um, we will make sure they get answered offline. Um, so yep. next question is, what do you think are the pros and cons of E1 versus business essentials? Good question. Um, and to be fair, if you're a commercial organization, we're only recommending E, and there's no one's asked the question about Microsoft 365 versus Office 365, and that's that's for another webinar, to be fair, because that's about security. But the difference between the enterprise licenses and the business business licenses, E1 or business essentials, is really around advanced functionality. And the most common one that we see that is um, a talking point is litigation hold or and, and the various security functions around that. So for users that would like to know about that, that is just around the ability to freeze an inbox in its, uh, or, or, or an inbox or, or a or document store. And it's usually used when you've got a staff member that is leaving and you want to make sure they don't delete or change things. Um, that is the most common function. I, I might, what I'll do is as I think we'll answer this in more detail, I'll talk to one of my engineers, Alex, um, who's actually, I think he might be watching this, um, who might give a couple of the other key points. The thing is that Microsoft will have this big table and it's got lots of them, um, but there's probably only a couple of real world reasons why you would choose E1 over business. However, the discounts for not-for-profits mean that it's kind of worth if you're going to go to E1 or business essentials because E1 is free, you might as well just take that option. So you don't lose anything by picking E1 over business, you only potentially lose something by picking business over, over enterprise. Thanks, Conan. Um, okay, final question for the day. Um, talking about migration, do you guys have experience with Salesforce to integrate Salesforce and Office 365? 
It's a good question. I mean, you've really got to look at the Salesforce integrations with the individual items. The good thing about Salesforce is it's a really commonly used, you know, it's probably the biggest CRM in the world. Maybe Dynamics is up there. So with, uh, with Salesforce, Salesforce integrates with Exchange, Exchange Online, yes. Salesforce integrates with SharePoint, yes. OneDrive, yes to a degree, depending on how you use it. Teams, yes. And then you look at other things. So the individual integrations are, are there. And yes, we have some experience with it. It's not as common uh, among our customer base, but it is. Um, we, we have one customer that basically spent a year doing these very, very complicated integrations, but they are a very big organization. Um, we could potentially have a chat about that if you're interested, just on if you have a particular example of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Great, thanks, Conan. Um, we'll okay. call it for questions now. Um, was there anything you wanted to add before we wrap up the session? Uh, no, look, I think it's just that um, it can seem complicated, but um, most of these services are what you know half of the world are starting to use, and so it, it is a very um, is a very functional and usable system, and we would recommend people start to transition to it. I can't really, and, and if, if your IT provider says you can't, tell, tell them can't move to Office 365 at all, tell them I said that that was rubbish. Um, but uh, any questions, big or small, if you're really daunted by the prospect um, and just want to have a bit of a chat about your situation, let us know, um, and uh, yeah, we'd be happy to help. So. Yeah, that's all from me. And there's going to be more webinars coming and delving into them more in more detail. If you've started down this journey or you haven't, I'd still think it could be worthy to have a look at those. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Conan, for presenting today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you've all learned a lot from, from the presentation um, and that your questions have been answered. The ones that haven't been, I will email them through to Conan and his team and they will address it offline. Um, if you do have any other questions that come to mind later on or any feedback, please send that through to events at connectingup.org um, and we will answer that offline as well. You can contact Conan and his team directly via the information on your screen. Um, there will be a few more webinars coming up um, over the next couple of weeks so I will send those links out for you to register if you're interested in them um, with the recording shortly. Uh, I will also send a link out to the Teams webinar that um, the IT team did a few weeks ago for us for those of you who have expressed an interest in that. Again thank you for being with us, enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks Conan, thanks everyone. Thanks a lot, take care.